Thank you very much. Yes, I, I am in such a silly mood today. I'm going to ask for forgiveness right up front. I put so much corn into this message, it's like a tortilla. <laughs> Strange things happen to me when I spend late nights here in the office putting a message together, and I ask your forgiveness immediately. We are back in the book of Romans, chapter 15. And what I take away from this is Paul, the priest, the pioneer, and the partner. There's no one in the first row. I won't worry about spitting today. <laughs> Paul, in chapter 15, is basically wrapping up the book of Romans, and he's kind of dumping his heart about his life and where he's going and what he's doing and what his plans are and, and all of that, as you might think in a personal letter. So it's not the, the heavy doctrinal stuff that we've been dealing with. Recently, we looked at how it is to live in liberty, what it is to be in Christ Jesus, where we're allowed to do certain things, but maybe not everyone's allowed to do the things that we do. And so we should be sensitive to the people that we're with, that we don't offend them or cause them to stumble. So we've, we've gone through all of that. And now we're getting to a place where uh, he's just going to dump his heart about what's going on. And you're going to see him in these various roles here. You're going to see him as a priest, where he views his ministry as a priesthood. You're going to see him as a pioneer, where he goes where no one else has gone, you know, the whole Star Trek thing. And then you're going to see him as a partner, where he links arms with this Roman church, the church that he did not start and these people that he does not know. He's now going to link arms with them as he tries to get around there. But before we get started, let's pray. Our Father and our God, thank you for this wonderful day. Thank you for a time when we can remember our mothers and for those that are mothers and the difficult job that that is and how it's the most precious job, I think, on the face of the planet and yet most unappreciated. Lord, I pray that you might help us this day to appreciate the gift that you gave to each one of us as a mother. Good or bad or indifferent, we were born. Not an easy thing. And we thank you, Lord, for blessing us with moms. We pray that you help us to show our appreciation to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So happy Mother's Day. By the way, mother is a verb. Just thought I'd let you know that. Mother is something you do you know, when you mother someone. It's a verb. It's an action. It's not uh, just a position, right? It's like pastor. Pastor is something you do. It's not somebody you are necessarily. So you all get that? Good. I'm going to really require a lot of support today because I'm feeling vulnerable. You know, you might be one of those who says, oh my God, I'm starting to look like my mother. <laughs> and that happens. From what I understand. I just hope it doesn't happen to me. And I saw this wonderful Mother's Day card online I thought I would share with you. A mother is a person who, seeing that there are four pieces of pie for five people, promptly announces. That's it. That's the whole card right there. And you probably could fill in the blank, and maybe that's the whole point. Filling in the blank is, sees that there are four pieces of pie for five people and promptly announces, we're going out to eat. I think that's probably the punchline if you open the card, but there's, it's, it's a virtual thing. So um, happy Mother's Day to all of you. And I hope you have a great day. Moving on, our life in Christ in the book of Romans in chapter 15. Paul's going to dump his heart, and essentially this is like the last chapter. And then there's a last chapter after the last chapter, so you'll see what I mean beginning in verse 14 of chapter 15. Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. Nevertheless, brethren, 
I have written more boldly to you on some points as reminding you because of the grace given to me by God that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus in the things which pertain to God. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things in which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed to make the Gentiles obedient. In mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about to Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. And so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. But as it is written, to whom he was not announced, they shall see. And those who have not heard shall understand. For this reason, I also have been much hindered from coming to you. But now, no longer having a place in these parts and having a great desire these many years to come to you, whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you. For I hope to see you on my journey and be helped on my way there by you, if first I may enjoy your company for a while. But now I am going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. For it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia that to make certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. It pleased them indeed that they, it pleased them indeed, and they are their debtors. For if the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in material things. Therefore, when I have performed this and I have sealed to them this fruit, I shall go by way of you to Spain. But I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. And now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ, that through the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from those who are in Judea who do not believe, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, that I may come to you with joy by the will of God and may be refreshed together with you. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. It's a very large chunk of scripture. So I'll take big chunks. So Paul is writing to the Romans and he's basically summing everything up instead of the deep theological things. He's now basically summing up what his plans are and any plans on coming to them. And sorry, I haven't gotten to you. I've been kind of busy. And so he begins by saying, now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written more boldly to you in some points as reminding you. Paul basically says, listen, I know I've told you a bunch of things. It's not that I think you're a bunch of infants and that you can't do it. It's I believe that you can do it. I believe you can admonish one another. You can love on one another. You know what you're doing. But I thought that I would just remind you of some things. And I guess it's good because when you say that to somebody, they tend to listen. You know, listen, I know you already know this, but I just want to remind you. Although if you continually remind somebody, it's called nagging. Just thought I'd let you know. Anyway, the purpose and process of Paul. Yes, everything has a P. I'm repenting now. This is his purpose and his process. He wanted to encourage them and he wanted to remind them. It's important to do that, right? I don't know about you, but do you have to get reminded? <laughs> By the way, you know it's garbage night. <laughs> yes. So, you, you know it's 8.30. Yes. You know, when you get irritated because somebody reminds you, it's because you forget. And if you always remembered, no one would ever need to remind you. So the way to accept a reminder is to say, yes! And people will remind you less. 
This on Mother's Day. You're welcome. There's a lot of reminding. Paul reminds people all the time. For this reason, I have sent to you Timothy, my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, and he will remind you of my ways in Christ and teach you everywhere as I teach in every church. So Timothy comes to remind, and, and Paul sends him along to remind people of his lifestyle in 1 Corinthians. In 2 Timothy, he says, Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. He tells Timothy, Stop being so timid. Get out of your shell. Go and get about the things that the Lord wants you to do. Apparently, Timothy was a bit of an introvert, like me. In 2 Timothy 2.14, remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers, period. Ignore that last bit that's left over. That's pastor error. <laughs> remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord not to argue about words. So guys, I'm going to remind you, don't argue about words. That's not what you said. Now I know none of you argue like that, but I do. So I need to be reminded. So good reminder. Thank you, Lord. In Titus 3.1, remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities to obey and be ready for every good work. I was told to Titus, who was a young pastor of a church from Paul, and even Peter himself reminds, 2 Peter 1, 12, for this reason, I will not neglect to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. So part of the job of a pastor or a teacher, and certainly the word of God, is to remind us of things because it is our doom that we forget. Amen? Amen. And the older you get, the less you remember. And Jude uh, one five says, but I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Just because you've come to a church doesn't necessarily mean that you're saved. You have to mix with that some faith, and you've got to actually put one foot in front of the other. And so he was reminding them that not everybody who sits under good teaching or even bad teaching knows and has a relationship with Jesus Christ as their Savior. So just heads up for that. So do you need encouragement and reminding? Yes. You know, some of us need encouragement. Not me. I'm full of encouragement. I'm very encouraged today because I was able to do a silly... Anyway, yes, some people need encouragement. And that means to give someone courage. That's what encouragement is. You know, there are people who are timid and unsure and not sure exactly what the Lord would have them do, and they need to be encouraged. I bet you you can find somebody right in this room today that needs to be encouraged. Although don't hug them unless they want you to. <laughs> because of the grace given to me by God that I might be a minister to, of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. He is a priest to his people. You see, he uses this language of, I am taking the sacrifice of the Gentiles, these people who don't know God. And if you look through the book of Acts, you'll see everywhere he went and all of the crazy things that happened to Paul. And he, his job is to make sure that these people are acceptable to God as a sacrifice. So when he stands before the Lord... And he says, listen, these are the people that I shared the gospel with. These are the people that I taught and spent time with, that they'll be acceptable unto the Lord. That's a pretty good heart, isn't it? I, I could use more of that heart. Because not everybody is a faithful leader of the people of God. And so you want to be sensitive to that. It says in Romans 9, 2, and 3 that, I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. I wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. Paul's heart for the Jewish people, his own people, is I wish that I could get cut off and be sentenced to a life in hell if my people would just listen and get saved. That's his heart for his own people. And this is the heart he has for the Gentiles. I'm a minister coming to them, and of course, 
you know, he, he being on the Sanhedrin and being the, a, a Jewish rabbi and a Jew of Jews, he wouldn't associate with Gentiles afraid that he'd get some dirt on him morally. So God had to do a great work in his heart of grace for him to be able to reach out to these people that he's hated all of his life. And so here's his heart. He says, I am doing my best so that these people will be presentable before God. And that's his heart. What a great heart that is, right? Like... When I encourage and remind you, I'm doing that so that you will be an acceptable sacrifice before God, because that's my job as a priest of the people. What a great heart that is. He's concerned with the spiritual well-being of all his people. Now, not all the priests were good. If you know who Nadab and Abihu are, they were the priests of Aaron who burned what the scripture calls profane fire to the Lord. And it's kind of ambiguous and people argue about what in the world that means. But directly after that, there's an admonition that the priests aren't to drink wine or any intoxicating drink. So I kind of think they got lit before the service and then they went up and they did this religious service in hypocrisy because they were lit, you know, inebriated. I need to improve my vocabulary. So... So Paul is saying, listen, I don't, I, don't, I don't just take this for granted. I want to make sure that everybody is presentable before God. So my question to you and the question to me as I read through this as well is, what's, what's your ministry? Is it your sense that God has called you to speak to people and that they go away from your presence better than when they entered? What's your ministry to them? What is it that you have to offer them? And I think it's a really good question. I, this is reading the Bible as a devotional, okay? That's, that's what basically this is. You look at it and you read it and you say, okay, I understand what it means and uh, okay, I, I understand what it says. Now, what does it mean to me? What is my ministry? I think it's to have every single person that you speak to go away better off than when they met you. That you hand something off to them that they need and it, it might need me, you know, it might need to be a rebuke. It might need that they need to straighten up a fly right. It might, it might be that you need to encourage them. It might need that you, you need to teach them something or explain something to them or uh, answer them or counsel them or pray with them or whatever it is. Um, we, my wife and I ran into a woman at the gym and uh, we've had some spiritual conversations and she's made it very clear that she won't ever be visiting here. But she took us aside one day and said, listen, I'd really appreciate it if you would pray for one of my relatives. And so I put my hand on her shoulder and I said, let's pray. And right in the middle of Planet Fitness, my wife and I prayed with this woman and she began to cry. Now this, this woman is a hard nut. But the Lord broke her heart. Do you see yourself as a minister of Jesus Christ so that when you see people, you can touch them with the hand of God, with the love of Jesus Christ, so that they walk away different? You can do that, you know. You can do that. Paul continues in verse 17, Therefore, I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus and the things which pertain to God. And I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed to make the Gentiles obedient. Basically, Paul's saying, listen, I got a lot to be thankful for. You know, I was lost, now I'm found. <laughs> you know, I was, I was on, on my mount and I was riding into a town and I was gonna have Christians murdered. And the Lord Jesus Christ knocked me off my beast and straightened out my head. He says, I have a lot to be thankful for. He says, I'm not going to tell you about anything that hasn't been done. I'm not going to make up glorious stories to impress you. I'm going to tell you what really happened. And I have a lot to be thankful for about what God's done through me. When I hear that kind of thing, or when I'm tempted to do that kind of thing, I just, I feel like it's a little arrogant. But is it God who's getting the glory or is it you? And see, that's really the question. Are you trying to, uh, you know, get people on your side to feel bad for you or feel good for you? Or, or is it you want to encourage people in Christ? And he says, listen, I've got a lot to be thankful for. He has positive praise. 
He's got positive praise about how God's using him among the Gentiles, a people group he never would have guessed that he would be a minister to. In Romans 12, 3, he says this, for I say through the grace given to me that not everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Paul says you need to think of yourself soberly. There are certain things you can do and certain things you can't do, right? Don't think, I'm going to be a professional baseball player. It might not happen, especially at your age. There are things that you can do and there are things that you can't do. You should know what that is. You should be a mature person before the Lord to know these are things I can do and these are things that I can't do. I would never get a job doing intense physical labor for 12 hours a day. I'm a 57-year-old man. I can only, no, I'm not. I'm 58 years old. <laughs> I need to be reminded. That's why I have a wife. <laughs> my frame is not such that 12 hours a day on my back, would, would, I would last. So I don't do that. I do this, which is I, I work for a good solid 45 minutes a week. As far as you know, he's got this positive praise that God has done things through his life and in his ministry and through him to other people. And he's, he's grateful to God for it. He's not boasting about it. Like, you know, God picked a really good guy in me, but he's thankful that God has used him in other people's lives. And I think we can do that. I think when somebody goes away and they're changed and their life has changed, you can say, God, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity of using me. And obviously you, you've used me because this person's, you know, been affected. Thank you. And you give praise to God. You don't say, you see that thing I did? You know, you go online, take a picture of yourself, say, I, I just want to let you know I just brought somebody to Jesus Christ. I, I hope you're all impressed with me. It's not that at all. He's thankful to God that he can even be used, that he's a, a worthy vessel that God chose. That's an amazing thing. And so I think for us to be thankful for that is good, as opposed to having some kind of false humility where we say, well, I don't do anything good. Uh, I'm nobody, you know. I don't have the charisma of Carl. <laughs> like, I can't reach the shelves in the kitchen <laughs> like he can. I think that's a false humility. Why aren't you grateful to God for what he's given you that you can do? And why aren't you researching that and laying hold of that? Because today's the day that the Lord's made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. He also says here in Galatians 2.20, I, I am crucified with Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20, worthy of a tattoo. Do you feel that? I don't live anymore. My life is the Lord's. It's Jesus Christ who lives in me. And I want to live out the inspiration that he gives me. I don't want to just do my own thing and go off on my own because that never fills my cup. So how's your praise life? How's your praise life? See, I, I told you it's like a devotional. I go through this and I ask these questions of myself. How's my praise life? Am I thankful? And that's a little why I'm wired today because I went through this and I was like, well, how is my praise life? Well, oh my goodness. I have so much to be thankful for. I mean, I, I see people here today I haven't seen in a while, and I get excited when I see them. I, I, gave, I gave somebody a hug like this. It was Jane Mokarski. I gave her a hug because she's trying to be careful. But I haven't seen her in a long time, and I would love to catch up with her, but, you know, it's, it's such a life. So... How's your praise life? Are you thankful? Are you grateful? Do you see that God is using you and that you're making an impact in this world for the better and that you're pointing people to Jesus Christ? I, my goodness, we have a lot to be thankful for. Kick up your praise life. Verse 19 in mighty signs and wonders and power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all around, Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. 
The Apostle Paul says, by the way, God's used me to do some awesome stuff like healings and casting out of demons and things. Oh, by the way, uh, a lyricum is Yugoslavia, Albania. You might, you might know those words a little bit more familiar. So if you were wondering where a lyricum was, he's basically saying from north to south, I've, I've preached the gospel fully. I've done my best. There's power in his preaching. It comes with the evidence of the Holy Spirit, not just fine-sounding words and arguments. If you look in the book of Acts, it begins in Antioch in 1348. It says, now, when the Gentiles heard this, that they were glad and they glorified the word of the Lord, as many as had heard and been appointed to eternal life, believed. There were these Gentiles who heard him speak and they put their faith in Jesus Christ. Awesome. That doesn't happen unless the power of the Holy Spirit is behind what you say. I mean, he preached a really good sermon if you look at it. And he preached Jesus Christ crucified, risen from the dead. In Iconium, eight, in uh, Acts 14.3, it says, Therefore, they stayed there a long time speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done at their hands. Paul was there and there were people that were being healed. There were things that were going on. And that was a confirmation that the spirit of God was with this guy and you should listen to him. That's why it happened. So, why don't those things happen anymore? Well, do you need to know that God is with his word? <laughs> you go into the mission field, I have a feeling you might see a bit more of the miraculous than you do around here in Middletown. But here's the deal. He gave him signs and wonders done by their hands. They went and ministered, and the Lord enabled them to heal people and cast out demons. They were in Lystra in Acts 14, 9 and 10. It says, this man heard Paul speaking, Paul observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, imagine this, in the middle of the synagogue, in the middle of church, stand up straight on your feet. <laughs> and he leaped and walked. This is a guy who was lame since birth in his feet. He couldn't stand. And he's sitting there, Paul's in the midst of a congregation much like this, and he looks at the guy and he says, hey, you, stand up straight on your feet. <laughs> and the guy's lame. You know, he would, you would picture that to be a very embarrassing situation if he didn't, right? Well, I've been lame since I was born. But see, Paul saw that he had the faith to be healed. And he spoke it. And the Lord inspired him to say it. And there were miracles that were done. How, how are you not appreciative that God uses you in a situation like that? Amen. Well, I'm really nothing. Well, of course you're nothing. But look what you did. <laughs> By the power of the Holy Spirit, you can do all things. Amen. Do you think you're any different? In Philippi, in Acts 16, 18 to 19, there was this woman. She was possessed by a demon. But she had the ability to tell the future, and she was a slave. And her owners used to profit from her knowing certain things. But apparently she got loose, and she found some apostles walking around sharing the gospel. And she told them, these men have the words from God about salvation. And she was like a herald, like, you know, ding, 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 ding. Except somebody with a demon, that's not really somebody you want publishing for you. And so this annoyed Paul. Days of this, as he was trying to minister and preach, and she did this for many days, but Paul, greatly annoyed, <laughs> turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But when her masters saw that their hope for profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace and to the authorities. It's no good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> but see, what you don't understand is there's a jailer waiting for them. And they strip off their clothes and they beat them with rods and then they throw them in jail and put them in chains. And around midnight, they begin to worship. And they sing hymns unto God. Probably no hymns that you know. And it says that all the other prisoners were listening to them and that God caused an earthquake to shake that place. And all the doors opened 
and all the chains dropped off of them. And the jailer, who's standing outside the main door, said, I'm done. These guys are all out of here, and I'm, I'm going to die. They're going to cut my head off because I haven't done my job. And he took his sword, and he was just ready to run it through himself. And Paul stopped him said, ho, 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 wait. We're all here. Nobody's gone. Don't kill yourself. Put the thing down. Talked him off the ledge. Shared the gospel with him. He ends up taking them home, getting them all cleaned up, binding their wounds, and they share the gospel with this whole household. You know, when crazy things happen and the power of the Spirit of God is with you, don't worry about what's going to happen because God's got a plan and he's taking you to a place where you might not know and it might not be your plan, but it's his. And so all of these things happened to Paul, all these crazy things. And how do you not say, God has used me mightily and his spirit of God is, is in me. He says in 1 Corinthians 2, 4, and 5, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Across this great world, they have places of higher learning for Bible college students called a seminary. Very often, it's a cemetery <laughs> because they teach you how to speak so well, and yet what it does is it makes you so reliant upon words and emotions and little tricks to get people to listen that the Spirit of God is empty of it. Paul said, listen, when I came to you, I didn't come to you with fine-sounding uh, arguments. I didn't come to you with high, long words, eschatological, hermeneutical, exegetic words. I came to you with the simple gospel, but I came to you with a demonstration of power because the Spirit of God motivated me to speak what I spoke. That makes sense. So, all these mighty signs and wonders, he says again in 1 Thessalonians 1.5, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know, what kind of men we were among you for your sake. What do you think he means by that? You know what kind of men we were among you. See, Paul lived his life in front of people. He wasn't cloistered in a corner somewhere and he made tents, by the way. So he's making these tents, and he runs into a couple of other fellow tent makers, and he kind of elbows up with them, and he says, yeah, 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 and he starts sharing with them Jesus Christ, and they get saved, this married couple. Priscilla and Aquila. And he elbows up with them, and they're making tents together, and he's sharing the gospel with them. And he's going, you guys know what kind of a guy I was when I was among you. I wasn't a slouch. You know, I wasn't sitting on a throne you know, getting my feet rubbed. You know, I was, I was working. And you saw a demonstration of what it was to be Christ-like. Fully preaching the gospel of Christ involves a clear presentation of Christ-likeness. It's not just what you say, it's what you do. In fact, what you do should speak so loud that you rarely have to speak a word. And people will ask you, what is the reason for the hope that is in you? He says, you know what kind of power of the Holy Spirit will cause you to have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, meekness, faithfulness, self-control, all of that. So, is there power in your presentation? Is there the Spirit of God involved in your daily life and in your words and in your interactions with people? I don't know about you, but I could use bigger doses of that. How about you? Like, Holy Spirit, just motivate me, strengthen me, give me wisdom, help me to understand, help me not to forget, and help me to say the things that you want me to say. Because it's not about me, it's about you. And when that happens, then life-changing events occur. and People's lives change. And they're encouraged, and they're strengthened, and they're corrected, and they're rebuked, and all the things that we should do. And so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. But as it is written, 
To whom he was not announced, they shall see, and those who have not heard shall understand. See, Paul had a very clear understanding as to what his priority was. He was a pioneer. He had a pioneering priority, which means I go where people haven't heard about Jesus Christ and I tell them about Jesus Christ. I don't go to other places and build a church with those who already know Jesus Christ. I go to where Jesus has never been mentioned. And then he gives you a passage. So the question is, should everybody have this vision? Well, it's not everybody's vision. It's not my vision. I'm, I'm planted here in Middletown for you guys. Or should I be a missionary? Well, you know, Pastor Dave, if you really were called by God, if you really were a spiritual man, you'd be out in the mission field. I don't think so. But Paul knew who he was. Paul knew what he should do, and he had a Bible verse to back it up. That's pretty cool. You know, it's important to know your purpose. That's the biggest thing that happened to people when they retire. It's not about being tired again. That's not retired. <laughs> retired usually means I'm done working. I don't have to do anything. I'm just going to live off my income if I've saved enough and I've been wise up to this point, and I'm going to do whatever the heck it is I want to do. And people die early because of that. And they get depressed because of that. Because there's no one who needs you. You have no purpose in life. You have no driving force that says, I've got to get up in the morning. I need to be a certain place because it's important. Because if I'm not there, I will be missed. Amen. We don't understand how important that sense of belonging purpose is until you don't have it. I remember getting hurt and then being unemployed. And I was like, this is a worthless existence. But God gives us purpose. He gives us the priorities of our life. And for Paul, his priority was going where they never heard of Jesus. And he was like, Lord, I'm going to get to talk to some unbelievers today. Now, most people are like, oh, my goodness, I can't. I'm, I'm hanging with Paul, and every time he opens his mouth, he's sharing the gospel with somebody. I'm totally embarrassed. I can imagine that. But that was Paul's priority. He didn't go where Christ was preached. He went where he wasn't preached. Now, what are you going to do about that? <laughs> the scripture says, Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. Where there is no vision, my people perish. You may know it in the King James. Where you don't understand what it is that God wants you to do or where God's taking you, you will fall off. You can fall into depression and selfishness and all sorts of really bad behavior because you feel like you have nowhere to go, nothing to do, nobody to see, and your life doesn't have any meaning. Paul said, I have meaning, I have purpose, I have a priority. I go where they don't know about Jesus, and that's what I tell them. That's who I am. And oh, by the way, I got a Bible verse for that. It's a pretty good way to live. He said, I don't want to build on another man's foundation. You know what that's like? Building on another man's foundation, coming in when they already have a certain understanding and then trying to build on top of that. He says, I don't want that. <laughs> I want to go and put the foundation in. He was a foundation builder. I'm not a foundation builder. I'm, I'm a pastor. So I, I try to build on the foundation of Jesus Christ and whatever's been set. So I, I know what my calling is. Do you know what yours is? What part of the construction team you're on? What has God told you to do? And do you have a Bible verse for that? It's important. It's really important to know who you are and who God's called you to be and say, listen, I can point to a Bible verse to verify what it is that God's called me to do. You know I have a Bible verse? I got a bunch of Bible verses, but I have one. It says, go into all the world and make disciples, which is disciplined followers of Jesus Christ, fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. That's, I believe, God's call in my life.
Maybe I should look into something else. No, that's what God's called me to do. For this reason, I also have been much hindered in coming to you. So Paul is now apologizing. I told you it's corny. Everything has a P in it. So he gives an apology. And that's the way you talk if you're from certain places. Anyway, so he gives an apology. I haven't been there because I've been busy. I've been planning churches. I go where there's no church and where no one's gone before, you know, the whole Star Trek thing. And that's what he does. And he says, so I haven't come to you guys. Apparently there's a church already started there. So they don't really need him. But he wants to go to Rome. And he wants to get in front of Caesar. And he wants to tell him about Jesus Christ. I mean, this is, this is where he's at. Verse 23, but now no longer having a place in these parts. He sounds like a southerner. But notice the peas. I didn't put them there. But no longer having a place in these parts and having the great desire these many years to come to you, whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you. For I hope to see you on my journey and to be helped on my way there by you, if first I may enjoy your company for a while. That's probably the most gracious invitation that somebody could ever say. I say, hey, by the way, I'm going to be passing through. I'm going to stop at your place. But he has this passionate plan for partnership. He wants to link arms with them and be a partner with them. And part of that is they're going to kind of not send him to the you know, Motel 8 somewhere down the street. They're going to take him in and he gets to spend time with them and have a relationship with them. So he's kind of invited himself to be with them as partners out in Rome. So this is where Rome is, by the way. Rome is here. Uh, here's the boot, and here's Corinth, where he's writing this from, and here's Jerusalem. So he says, listen, I'd love to come see you, but I got to go this way, which is um, 1,500 miles, <laughs> by the way. And then, once I'm done there, I plan on coming all the way up here to see you. As I'm on my way to Spain, I'm going to stop off. And after 1,500 miles, and these people don't, you know, they don't have planes. That's a lot of miles to travel. And it's 3,000 miles. He plans on going to Spain. You know why? Because Christ has not been preached there yet. That's, that's how fired up he was about Jesus Christ, that he would go to those links. And I think that's amazing. So it's a little bit like when Jesus came and saw Zacchaeus in the tree. You remember? Zacchaeus, he was a wee little man. A wee little man was he? He climbed up in a sycamore tree because the Lord he wanted to see. You guys remember the song? Sunday school teachers are saying yes. Okay. He had a disability. <laughs> he was a short man. And he overcame that disability by climbing a tree and he got in Jesus' face and Jesus said, hey, what are you doing up there? It's a little fruity. You need to come down because we're going to your house for lunch. And invited himself over for lunch, which seems a little forward. But it was a great honor. And repentance came to his house and he said, listen, if I've taken anything, I'm going to restore it and then some. And he got saved and repented of his lifestyle because Jesus came and had lunch with him. What a great thing. So, do you have a partner? Do you have anybody that you can link up with and, and talk to and share in ministry with and kind of run over things with you? You should. You should have people that you can pray with. You should have people that are partnering with you. You should. Because it makes it a whole lot easy. Uh, it certainly makes it easier if you're going to pull a heavy object or if you're going to carry a couch or you're going to do any other thing. It's good to have somebody with you, right? I mean, setting up these tables and tearing down these tables goes much faster with two people than it does with one. And so it is with life. Having something to share and somebody that you can trust and you share those things with is important. And he's wanting to pair up with them. So he says, but now I'm going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. For it pleased those in Macedonia and Achaia that I, a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem... He has a pleasing payment for the poor. I told you it's corny. 
It's a pleasing payment for the poor because he's going to go to Jerusalem and they're experiencing a famine. Uh, there was a man named Agabus who predicted it would happen. And there was a famine in Jerusalem, not to mention all the persecution that was happening. If you remember uh, around the time of Nero with, you know, Rome burning and all of that, Christians were taking the blame for all sorts of things that they didn't do. And so they were under a lot of persecution. And because that was the place that sent all the missionaries out, that became the hub of where all the concentration of persecution was. And so Paul says, these guys are really suffering. And so these Gentiles, who aren't Jews at all, took up a collection. And I'm taking it to them to help them out, to relieve some of their suffering. So here's Paul's heart for them. He's gathering and taking up a collection for somebody that has a need. That's a great heart, isn't it? I mean, if I ever see anybody that comes up to me and say, Pastor Dave, I just want to let you know that somebody's got this thing and we're collecting money. Are you in? I've never had anybody do that. And I'm afraid to open the invitation. But if I think it's a worthy thing, I would absolutely give. Well, these Gentiles had a heart for the Jews and said, listen, they sent us all these, these Jewish believers and, they, and goodness sake, the Messiah comes from that. We want to help these guys out. And so they do. In 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, there's a whole lot more about it if you want to read about it. It talks about the collection and coming. And um, Here's one from uh, chapter 9, verses 6 to 8. But this I say, he who, spares, who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. He's telling them, if you're willing to give and to help other people, God's going to help you. So let each one give as he's purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you that you, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance in every good work. You see, Paul links God's blessings to you materially with the degree in which you're willing to let it go and help other people. And I think that's very, very right. So, are you sensitive to the needs of others? Are you willing to sacrifice of your time, your talents, your treasures for other people? Are you sensitive to the needs of other people? As you walk in the Spirit and you're intentional about it, the Lord will reveal to you people that have needs. And I can tell you, I've been blessed more than once by people in this congregation when I've had needs that they didn't know about, but the Lord must have, because suddenly they come up and they bless me in some way, shape, or form. Whether it's, whether it's a, a physical thing that I need or whether it's a financial thing or whatever it is. And, um, and I thank you. You know who you are. Verse 27. It pleased them indeed, and they are their debtors. For the Gentiles have been partakers of the spiritual things. Their duty is also to minister to them in material things. Therefore, when I have performed this and I have sealed for them this fruit... I shall go by way of you to Spain. But I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. He says, basically, I've got to go away and take care of this thing, but when I come, I know that I'll be ready to spend time with you guys and really pour my heart in. But I'm kind of distracted right now because I've got this project. So he's not trying to push them off. He's trying to let them know that he's got a priority. But he's got a payment to perform. And he himself is going to go do it. He's not sending somebody with it and trusting that they'll take care of it because there are dangers in carrying cash, right? I mean, there are people that get <laughs> jumped in broad daylight now. Nobody gives a rip. But he's got a payment to perform, and he's going to do it personally. He's going to go to Jerusalem personally. Now, you have to know who Paul is. Paul's kind of the outcast, okay? He's the guy who was killing Christians and then came around and accepted Christ, so people are a little standoffish about Paul. They're not sure whether he's an undercover brother or whether he's, you know, or whether he's a spy for the other side looking to kill people. But also he's preaching to Gentiles, which everybody knows that Christianity is basically what it is when you're a found Jew. And so this is all new to them. So he's kind of like the redheaded stepchild of, of Christianity. So he's not exactly, he's not one of the boys, he's not one of the 12. He's like one who's been uh, abnormally born out of time, he calls himself. So that's kind of his thing, but he's going to go personally and deliver this, this uh, finance. 
He says, for I'm already being poured out as a drink offering and the time for my departure is hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not to me only, but also those who have loved his appearing. You see, he knows that he's got things to do and it's a difficult task. He would rather go to Rome, but what he does is he goes to Jerusalem, 1,500 miles away, and he's going to go 3,000 miles out to Spain and stop by. And he knows what he has to do and he's willing to do that. I wonder how many of us would be willing to do that. Go way out of your way, not doing something you want to do, but something you feel you should do, and then get to do the thing you want to do. Do you have a thankful heart? Do you have a thankful heart? Thankful for the blessings that other people are to you, the blessings that God has given to you, the way he's preserved you, protected you. Do you have a thankful heart? It's something that we need to cultivate because otherwise, just like the ground outside, it's not going to produce any fruit unless it's cultivated. In verse 30, now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, that I may come to you with joy by the will of God and may be refreshed together with you. Paul's plea for prayer. Paul is begging them, please pray for me, which is pretty awesome. He prays for three things. Number one, that he would be protected from the unbelievers because they're trying to kill him. They want to kill him. And so as he goes to Jerusalem, he knows that they're going to be there waiting for him, the Judaizers, the people that don't recognize his authority. Number two, that he would be accepted by the saints, that the gift that he gives would be accepted by the saints, that they would warmly and appreciatively take this gift. And number three, that he would be presented to the Romans with joy and be refreshed. So he asked them to pray for three things. And he says, I want you to agonize with me, by the way, strive together. That word is agonizo. I want you to strive in prayer with me to pray about these things. And you would think if the apostle Paul and some churches and believers prayed these things, that God would answer, right? I mean, after all, we just sang it. You're never going to let, never going to let me down. No. Right? You remember we sang that today. That wasn't so bad. Why are you looking at me like that? Anyway. I don't plan any of this. In Acts chapter 21, we see where he actually gets to Jerusalem with this gift. And what he does is he hurries himself up and he goes to give this gift. As he goes into Jerusalem and he gives this gift... They say, hey, Paul, glad that you're here. Hey, thanks for the gift. Let's give it to this guy over here. Hey, come here. We got something we want to talk to you about. There are a bunch of these Judaizers. Man, they hate you. They want to kill you. They don't think you're a Jew anymore because you're with the Gentiles. They think you've like denounced Judaism. So what we want you to do is we want you to join with these guys who are taking a vow and we're going to go into the temple and it's going to be a big religious thing just to show people that you haven't completely neglected your roots. And he goes, okay. And so he ends up going with them, and of course he's got an entourage with him. He's got a bunch of guys who are traveling with him, and a bunch of these Judaizers who were on the look for him said, there he is. And he's going in the temple, and he's going in with some of his buddies. They're Gentiles. I just know it. They're not circumcised. They don't belong in there. And so because they were looking to pick a fight, they picked a fight. They drag him out. They beat him up. And guess what? He has to get rescued by the Romans. The Romans have to protect him from his own people. And so they grab a hold of him and say, what the heck is going on here? And he speaks to the centurion, who, who's, who's in charge of 100 men, and he says, listen, can I speak to these people? He goes, listen, you're speaking to me in Greek. What's up with that? He said, well, this is the Jersey version. You're speaking to me in Greek. How, I thought you were an Egyptian. He goes, no, I'm not an Egyptian. They said, I thought you were one of these guys overthrowing the government. And he goes, no, I'm, I'm a Roman. He's a Roman citizen. He is. Because of where he grew up. 
He's instantly a Roman citizen, even though he's a Jew. And he says, can I speak to the people? And he goes, yeah, sure, go ahead, man. Paul has a captive audience with a bunch of bouncers. And he shares about Jesus Christ from the top of the stairs in the Antonio Fortress. And when, as soon as he mentions Gentiles, the crowd goes wild and goes try to kill him. Well, that's great. I came to deliver a gift to Jerusalem. They hornswoggle me into this religious thing. I get beat up, and the Romans have to come and deliver me. Okay. So what happens? Well, he gets put in jail. He gets put in jail for two years. And you'd think he'd have lots of visitors. Zero. So, what the heck happened with Paul's prayer? Paul said, I want to be protected from the unbelievers. They beat him up, dragged him out. He said he wanted to be accepted by the saints. They really didn't even say thank you. And they didn't visit him for two years. And he says, I hope to be presented to you in Rome with joy and to be refreshed. Can you imagine Paul sitting in a cell thinking, I can't believe I prayed for these three things and those three things didn't happen? Or did they? Paul says, I wanted to be protected from the unbelievers. Did he not provide the Romans? He was hoping that the gift would be accepted. Well, it turns out later on, Peter says, you know what? This Paul guy, he says a lot of things, hard to understand. But he writes scripture, which means the Holy Spirit of God's with him. So apparently he won over Peter. And what about being presented with joy and be refreshed in Rome? Well, little did he know that God was going to have an all-expensed paid voyage for him on the Roman dime. Because after two years, he says, I'm sick and tired of this. I appeal to Caesar. And they said, to Caesar you'll go. And so he gets to share the gospel all along the way, by the way. Festus. And he's got all these folks that he's telling about Jesus as he goes. And he eventually does get to Rome and he states his case before Caesar. It wasn't the way that he thought it would work out. But God answered all three of his prayers. Just not the way that he thought. Are your prayers answered? Do you pray things and get prayers answered? They might be answered in ways that you just don't understand. God works in mysterious ways, it is true. And yet, sometimes we pray for things and it doesn't seem like it's happening. Know this, brothers and sisters, that God has a plan. He knows what he's doing. We don't. So we need to get on board with what he's doing. Last slide. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. The God of peace. Peas. That's why there's peas. That's why there's peas everywhere, okay? I'm sorry. Let the peas of God. I told you it was corny, all right? Let the peace of God be with you all. Amen. The purpose and process of Paul was to encourage and to remind them with this letter. He was a priest to his people. Everything he did was to make these folks acceptable to God. It wasn't about him at all. He had positive praise about what God had been doing and what God was going to do through his ministry. There was power in his preaching because the Holy Spirit of God was there. Pioneering was his priority. He didn't want to build on another man's foundation. He wouldn't go where somebody else started a church. He made an apology. There's a passionate plan for partnership. He said, by the way, I'm going to be on my way to go to Spain. I've got this vision that God's going to take me there, and you're going to be part of it because I'm going to stop by. I'm coming to your house so you can be part of the ministry with me. 
He had a pleasing payment for the poor, which he took up among the Gentiles and delivered to the Jews. He had a payment to perform, and so he went. And Paul's plea for prayer. So you see why I say, now the God of peas be with you. You know, I, I get to research all this stuff, and I thank you guys that you pay my salary, and I get to look into all these things. You know, there's a, there's a term called mind your P's and Q's. You know where that came from? Apparently, no one does. The more you look, the less information you'll find. Uh, this is the way it is with the internet, isn't it? Do you, do you notice the four letters up here? D, B, Q, and P? If you're setting them in a type cast sort of thing, like they used to use to make newspapers, it's very easy to get them mixed up, especially if you're dyslexic. Or maybe you get them straight and everyone else would mix them up. But you mind your P's and Q's because a lowercase p and a lowercase q are exactly the same. Except, same thing with lowercase d and a b. Trivia. There's no charge for that one, guys, okay? <laughs> That was extra for today. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. I'd like you guys to pray with me. Father, this morning we look at Paul as an example of Christ-likeness. We see his heart was for his people to minister to them. We see that his heart was to go and to serve and to go to great lengths to do what you've asked him to do. Lord, I pray that you might use these things to spark our hearts to newness of life, that we might walk in these ways that you've asked us to walk in, that we might be a demonstration of your power and of your spirit and of your love to other people. Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the mothers that you've put into each one of our lives. May it be an honoring and spirit-filled day for all of us. In Jesus' name, amen.